Welcome to Wide Awake Stories from Insomniac. Oh, here's a little story I got to tell about three. You know so well. Welcome to the church of what's happening. Welcome to the church of Wide Awake Stories. From Insomniac. This is a journey by... A journey which along the way will bring to you new color, new dimension, new value. And a new experience. Broadcasting from the Insomniac HQ, this is Wide Awake Stories. Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode 8 of Wide Awake Stories. We are back in the studio, fresh off EDC Japan. What's going on, John Ochoa? I'm good, man. Had a busy, busy weekend of shows, which I'll talk about later. Excellent. And you, Rob? I am rest and relaxed, and I just got back from vacation, so I can't complain, and I'm getting ready to take another one. Work vacation. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And Sam Yu, uh, been deep, deep, deep in the track bunker, helping us with a new launch that we're going to talk a lot about today. How you going, Sam? I'm good. Very excited. Excited, very tired, ready for the weekend as always. Yeah, you partied a lot? <laughs> <laughs> How was your weekend? When'd you get up to, Rich? My weekend was pretty good, you know. EDC Japan was absolutely amazing. The crowd was out of control for our first ever trip to Japan. Uh, we had three stages at EDC Japan, one of which was a stadium right on the ocean and it was cool to just kind of walk along the beach during the morning and, and just see the kind of the waves roll in and then go into this massive stadium and just rave with a bunch of amazing headliners uh, for the first time. It was really cool. I don't know if uh, any of you caught this on social media, but Armin Van Buren dropped uh, Imagine by John Lennon during the middle of his set, which was a pretty, uh, pretty heart palpitating moment for yeah, sure. Absolutely. It was for, pretty rad, man. I watched the video. Yeah. It was uh, cool stuff. Man. I smiled inside. Give, give, give it the, give, hit you right in the feels. One tear came out exactly. <laughs> One, One tear, tear exactly came out. Right in the feels. As always, if you want to get a hold of us, the Wide Awake crew, you can find us on social media using the hashtag Wide Awake Stories. Find us uh, at insomniac.com on Twitter and Facebook. And if you want to check out past episodes of Wide Awake Stories, we are broadcasting on Mixcloud, Soundcloud, YouTube, iTunes, and now the brand new EDC radio channel on iHeartRadio. You can find all that and more at our home base, insomniac.com. The mothership, <laughs> insomniac.com mothership. You could also call us on the Wide Awake Hotline. Which that, has been blown up, by the way. Right, I know. Yeah. I know. We, we all take turns. There's one sort of bat phone that's the Wide Awake Hotline, and we all take turns kind of holding on to it. And it's been ringing nonstop. Yeah. Uh, we're a little afraid to answer it during work hours, though, because some we, we did it one time last week, and we just got in a really long conversation that we couldn't get out of. <laughs> that number, if you want to reach us, is 310-818-9406. That is the Wide Awake Hotline. It goes straight to us at Insomniac HQ. Welcome to Wide Awake Stories. Broadcasting from the Insomniac HQ. We've got a great show lined up for y'all. We're going to speak to our very own production gurus, Bear and Connor, who are in Texas right now setting up for the first ever yeah. Middlelands show. They're going to give us a report on uh, on really what it's been like to transform this Texas Renaissance Festival into this Renaissance rave yeah. concert. Renaissance rave is the best way to describe it. Renaissance rave. Renaissance, yeah. Hashtag Renaissance rave. With Rich Chica and Ray Remmer. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to go Danny off. Danny Brown. It's going to go off for it's sure. It's going to be amazing. What percentage of people do you think are going to be all dressed up? I want to say 100%. But it's it's a, it's a hard theme, man. You gotta find chainmail, swords, helmets, swords, <laughs> swords. <laughs> Where do are you, you gonna dress up, John? John and Rob are both gonna be out there. You gotta yeah. look for them because John, John will be promised. dressed as a merman. I did promise. <laughs> I, I, I think I'm gonna borrow a big fluffy pirate type shirt, and like I gotta a, find some stuff like a Seinfeld type. Yeah, movie. exactly. <laughs> like a Jerry Seinfeld just fluffy puff shirt, and maybe he was a pirate though. Yeah, but. It works. <laughs> Rave pirate. I'm on a deadline, dude. <laughs> it's really nice to breathe again. Yeah, last week was a pretty uh, bananas week. That's a understatement. We dressed sure. a little something, something that you all might have uh, seen on social media or tuned into on uh, Night Out Radio, the uh, EDC Las Vegas lineup announcement. Finally. Jeez. Right? Jeez. Yeah. Jeez, took us long enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's the earliest we've ever dropped the lineup. But it seems so weird because the memes and the we could literally comment with the cure for cancer on Instagram and people would be like, yo, that's great. <laughs> but, but where's the lineup? The lineup? 
Every other post. Where's every, the lineup? Every other lineup, yeah. The common thread easily. <laughs> but yeah, we dropped the EDC Las Vegas lineup. Let us know what you think. Uh, you can send us a tweet at insomniac.com. Hashtag Wide Awake Stories. Talk about the lineup. Are your favorite artists playing? Someone new? What do you think about that? Diplo, B2B Jaws, B2B Alice in Wonderland Yo, set. Yo, highlights it's for gonna sure. It's going to look pretty hype for sure. Fire. Of course... As Insomniac, you know we just can't put out the poster and list the names. We have to do a whole production and a whole big spectacle. Music so, through music. Yeah. We, we kind of did that Name That Tune vibe. Uh, eight different stages, eight mini mixes featuring one track from each artist played at rapid fire speed. And I saw tweets, people had scribbled down who they thought was going to be there. They, they took pictures of their phones and notes. They took pictures of pencils and papers. They had listening parties. We had a listening party at the office, a bunch of cases of beer and some pizza and a good time was had by all yeah, for sure. Absolutely. A few people had the EDC reveal going on on their uh, on their audio, and then they were watching the NFL draft yeah. on, on mute. And <laughs> that was such a busy day. It was a great day yeah. for a great day for humanity. <laughs> NFL draft and EDC lineup drop. I mean, not only was it a big deal here at the office and online with all our headliners, we actually uh, commandeered 96 channels on iHeartRadio's network and went live simultaneously with this huge, big production and this roadblock. Uh, we got some interviews with some amazing DJs, which we'll talk about in a second. And Pasquale himself offered this pretty amazing prize. You can win a helicopter tour of EDC Vegas. They put you up in a hotel. You get transportation, uh, VIP tickets, backstage passes, your own EDC concierge. Yeah, I want to sign up for merch. that. I mean, it's <laughs> can crazy. We win? I don't think we've ever offered a prize this big. And uh, it's all done in conjunction with this new partnership that we've got with iHeartRadio and our very own radio station. And if you want to win that prize, it literally could not be any simpler. All you have to do is download the iHeartRadio app and tune in to EDC Radio anytime between now and uh, in the beginning of June. EDC Radio is a brand new channel for all of you who are familiar with iHeartRadio. You've got the app. You love to listen to your different shows. Um, maybe you've gone to the iHeartRadio Festival. Um, we now have our very own home on iHeartRadio. It's called EDC Radio. We are going to be playing mixes, exclusive tracks, interviews. Wide Awake Stories will be broadcasting on EDC Radio. And our very own Sam, who's been deep, deep, deep digging. In the bunker, locked down. In the bunker down. with a spelunking helmet and a pickaxe and a whole list of label contacts uh, trying to make it happen for you guys so we have the best musical experience um, on EDC Radio for all you headliners. Sam, tell us a little bit about uh, what that's been like, what we got. I think this is the first time maybe we've seen you without headphones on in the last <laughs> week. Uh, yeah, so I've been busting my ass trying to uh, <laughs> yes. put together a decent music library that is reflective of the EDC experience. And what I mean by that is... Uh, imagine if you're at the festival and you're hopping from stage to stage, checking out a little bit of uh, bass music at the bass pod, hopping over to BassCon for Hardstyle, Factory for the Underground Sounds, kind of just recreating that fully immersive experience from the many worlds at the, of the EDC universe. EDC Radio is live now, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Download the iHeartRadio app and search for EDC Radio and tune in. Everyone is totally excited about this lineup. Um, we caught up with a few of the artists who are performing this year, and uh, they filled us in on some of their favorite EDC moments of the past and really what the festival means to them. You're tuned in to Wide Awake Stories. Hey, what's up? This is Diplo from Major Lazy Crew. The first time I played EDC was back when it was in California at the Coliseum. It's been about five, six times I've played since then. Every time it gets bigger and crazier and the energy gets higher. It's a party where anybody can come and enjoy themselves because I think when it comes to EDC, the music comes first. I know Pasquale likes to present as well, like the, the, the attendees and the star, which is a great vibe because it is about it is about you. The energy and the environment and the culture around these people sharing that together is, is the real is the real headliner. I'm very lucky this year I can play twice with Major Laser with my, my crew. You might recognize some of the songs we've had on the radio this last couple of years. And I get to play a second set back to back with Jaws and Alice in Wonderland. And the cool thing about the smaller sets and the back to back sets is that it's always improvised. You can never plan that out. Because whoever's there is going to help steer the direction one way or the other, and you have to think on your feet. And you get to play things you wouldn't expect because you don't you don't really 
have to rock the crowd with the hits. You get you get to rock the crowd with what they don't expect, and I love that. That's what a DJ's job is, you know, to be unexpected and to surprise people. It's like my favorite thing to do. This is Wide Awake Stories. What's up, guys? This is Zed, and I'm super happy to announce that this June I'm coming back to EDC. I think it's really important for people, artists, um, producers, festivals, anybody who has a voice and a following to speak up about what they believe in. All Our Welcome Here really resonates with me for many reasons, specifically because myself, I'm born in Russia, grew up in Germany, I live in America, I'm here on a visa, and seeing other people not welcome here really hurts me, and I think it's extremely important to speak up about it. I myself made a festival here in LA called Welcome that was also meant as a statement that we welcome everybody, no matter who you are, where you're from, what you believe in, who you're into. I think it's really important and nice to see festivals and anybody with the following really join this this movement to show that we can stand up for what we believe in and we don't have to follow everything the government tells you to do. I think it's crucial and more than ever now to stand up and speak up. Wide Awake Stories. Hey guys, this is Kaigo. I'm, I'm super excited to play EDC Las Vegas for the first time this year and I've been just seeing so many videos and so many photos from the previous years and it, it just looks amazing and the production is on another level. It's just so big and the crowd looks so great. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people tweeting at me before this year like seeing like wow well, why you not EDC, why, why you not playing EDC Las Vegas and I think they're gonna be happy this year when, when they see I'm playing and uh, I'm just excited to uh, to go check out the festival myself and, and play there. Wide Awake Stories. Hey, what's up? It's Martin Garrix. All are welcome here is an important phrase because everybody is welcome. And if there's one thing that unites everybody all around the world is music. It doesn't matter where you're from, who you are, what you like. There's one thing that everybody can understand and one thing that brings everyone together and that is music. So to me, that's a very, very fitting EDC slogan. Playing EDC for me for the very first time was an unreal experience. I remember arriving at the festival and, and having to pinch myself because there's so many different stages, there's so much firework and everybody who's there is just running around with a big smile on their face. And I remember doing the closing slot on the main stage and just seeing the sunrise at the festival, it was an amazing experience. Beautiful festival, beautiful sunrise and it was a very, very magical moment. So all are welcome here. What a great mantra! Yeah, it's been uh, it's been one of our mantras for forever, uh, as long as I can remember. You know, EDC it makes perfect sense too. I mean, that's what the rave scene is all about, yeah. right? Yeah, and I'm glad that these DJs really kind of relate to that and they understand why it's so important. And and I think they get it too that the most important headliner of all. I mean, that's something that Diplo mentioned. He realizes that the fans really are the lifeblood that kind of pulses through the entire electronic music experience so it was cool to hear him talk about that it was rad to hear that zed started his own festival i think it was called welcome and you know it just goes to show that uh all our welcome here reverberates across dance music more than more than just insomniac you know so speaking of reverberation sam you had a lot of that this weekend didn't you go to some art car festival what what'd you get up to i did it was uh Boogaloo Art Car Festival, and for those who don't know, it's this collective that has a theme camp and art cars at Burning Man uh, every year. And they were doing somewhat of like a fundraiser slash music festival. And I thought it was going to be a breeze, but it actually turned out to be a crazy, <laughs> crazy dust storm. Yeah, a little bit of Burning Man kind of came and popped, popped into their festival. So I was only there for one night, but the majority of the night, I spent it uh, salvaging people's camps because Easy Ups were getting just bent, bent to shit and tents were flying everywhere. And in that sense, it was a real disaster, but people were having fun and it was super interesting. You got to stay tuned, Sam, because I got a back in my day sand story <laughs> for you coming up later oh, on Rob's in the show. Oh, Rob's going back in the day. Rob, what did you get into on uh, your weekend? You you kind of went off the grid for a bit. I just got back from vacation, Turks and Caicos. I went on a little Bahamas vacation. Sounds tropical. It was, and I came back burned as fuck, got sun blisters all over my legs, lost my GoPro that I just bought like a day before the He's thing. He's still looking kind of red, man. 
Uh, no, I'm, Take I'm, care this of is it. tan rod. <laughs> tan rod. Lobster yeah. rod. Lobster tan rod. rod doesn't look healthy. Yeah, you sweet. look like you're having an allergic reaction. Wait, if you guys can see my legs, man, like I've no, got it's like okay. sun don't, don't, Let's go, don't do it. Like, it's cool. <laughs> I was out with the family at uh, Coachella for a weekend too, which is always great. It was my uh, 18th Coachella in a row, um, my son's third in a row. And uh, you got to actually meet Martin Garrix uh, at the Sahara Tent, who looks exactly like his brother. Like, they look like they could be brothers. I posted yeah. a photo to my Insta. What and, is it? Uh, you got to send people there because it is so, <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> it's, it's the two of them together and they literally look like they could be separated at birth. Like Martin looks like my son's uh, older brother, older, slightly more European brother. And he got to meet Ariana Grande too, which is kind of interesting. Did you say the Belleville three to the me? Belleville, yeah, got yeah. up on stage for the Belleville three. So it was a, it was a really good Sunday. You got a little bit That's of a uh, pretty good Sunday, a little bit of Garrix, a little bit of uh, Detroit techno and a little bit of Ariana Grande. Which <laughs> no never a kid. Thing. Never a bad <laughs> thing to have in your life. And John, what about you? You had a pretty, uh, pretty transformative experience over the weekend. I did. I was raving pretty hard this weekend. I went to our mousetrap takeover, which took place at our downtown LA warehouse, where you were usually host Factory 93. But this time we had a special guest, Dead Mouse, and a few of his label artists. And I don't go out too much anymore, and I'm so happy I did. I spent Saturday night at the warehouse. He played Strobe, and the whole venue just went off and went right into Levels from Avicii. And I've been saying for years now that song. If any DJ were to throw it down, it would still go off, and it absolutely did. Sam's giving you side eye right nah, now. Man. His head. <laughs> That's an instant classic, instant banger. I don't care if it was trolling, it went off. It worked. <laughs> the next night, I caught him at a, a different show where he brought out the cube. So to see his two different sets each night was really, really awesome. And it was great to just be on the dance floor again because I'm always behind the scenes at our trailers, working at our festivals or in the VIP area with all the other industry peeps and to be on the dance floor again was really fun and I hadn't had that type of fun in a really long time just because I'm usually working at these shows so if you're going to Middlelands make sure to look for John in the on the dance floor he's going to hold it down shirt. with you <laughs> so you ready for round two Middlelands Texas three days out in the middle of nowhere dancing camping yeah, raving full on camping raving yeah, festival for sure it's going to go off it's our first show at the Texas Renaissance Festival uh, and really our first time kind of intermingling with this amazing community that we got down I think Last time we were down there is Nocturnal, right? Yeah, Nocturnal, Texas. What, so. what year was that? Moons ago. <laughs> Many moons ago was the last time we were down. Insomniac was down there in Texas. Yeah, so it's good to be back. They say everything's bigger in Texas, so we'll see what Middlelands brings. It's the first year ever, and... We got a stacked lineup. We've got people from not just the dance music spectrum, but oh, we got yeah. hip-hop. We've got a little bit of rock and roll. It's going to be a, definitely one of the most eclectic lineups we've ever put out. We're bringing out dragons, castles, the whole production. Our production guys had to go down there and, and really kind of figure out how we were going to bring this festival uh, to this location for the first time and all the logistics behind... You know, all the freestanding structures that are already there and the, the new ones that we were going to build. So we linked up with uh, Bear and Connor, who are two of our most long-standing production guys, to really talk about what it's like kind of transforming this whole venue. So we're sitting here at Insomniac HQ with two, what I like to call visionary insomniacs for the company. Can you introduce yourselves, please? Yeah, I'm Alexander Bear. I am the production director for Insomniac Events, and I've been on board for, this is my 12th year, and seen us grow rapidly over those 12 years. Hi, I'm uh, Connor Bose, director of festival experience, deal with experiential elements related to the festival, and uh, I've been working for Insomniac for six years now. And you both are working on Middlelands right now as we speak. The festival is in a few days. Are we ready to go? What's what's the status on everything? Well, Middlelands is not so unlike any of the other festivals that we create. Of course, there's there's many challenges. This one's been a more of an exciting challenge because we're we're going into a venue that we've never done before, and it's very very different from the venues that we we normally do. Uh, the closest I think this comes to is a few years ago with Nocturnal, and outside of Austin, we went into a cornfield and built some very amazing events there for a few years and and here we're we're going into the texas renaissance fair which every year puts on from what i understand the largest renaissance fair in the country 
think of it as an artist palette or canvas and we're coming there and painting the insomniac uh, painting on that palette so walk me through the Middlelands Festival grounds. What size are we looking at? How big is it going to be? And how many people can we fit there? Well, square footage, it's probably the largest venue that we've put an event on. That includes the uh, uh, EDC in Las Vegas. Uh, and it's broken down into, it's one of our camping festivals. We've got five stages and we're not even utilizing the entire space that we could utilize. It's an interesting thing about the the size, similar to what Bear said. We have, it's kind of like a blank canvas. It's also a bit of a Rubik's cube. I've said this before. For a first year festival, you know, it's not going to be as large as we hope to eventually grow it. So having such a vast amount of space can actually be difficult, more difficult than it is easy. But also to contrast that the size of the Renaissance Village itself is not necessarily conducive to the size stages that we're used to producing. We've kind of had to take advantage of some of the, the space outside of the village and then also um, figure out how we're going to execute putting stages within this sort of enclosed space that is the, the Texas Renaissance Fair village. What I think is interesting as well is the difference in the type of terrain that we're moving into. Whereas Vegas, the speedway is all concrete and now we're working with grass and fields and open air and trees so does that does that cause any challenges in terms of building an atmosphere or a setting that you've never that you, you don't deal with uh, in, in compared to other festivals in some aspects it's it's more difficult but in others it's it's actually a lot easier uh, obviously when uh, it's at the speedway in Las Vegas we do have about 90 percent maybe even 95 percent asphalt very little grass that we're able to use so it makes the the construction a little more difficult of course you know the heat in las vegas makes it uh compounds that difficulty and then contrast that to the renaissance fair where it's almost a hundred percent grass and and uh, open area it's much easier to build it's much easier to construct some of these stages the only difficult part of that is it's mother earth and it's not level and it means we have to build differently than have something a nice flat surface asphalt surface now we've we're looking at you know hills and and uh, divots and and you know and in this particular case trees that we've had to you know massage and move around uh, we've even built a bridge across a, a small stream so we can get the the, the uh, number of people back and forth from the main village to the main stage right um, this particular venue also makes us vulnerable to not just Mother Earth, but Mother Nature itself. So uh, it being grass as opposed to a speedway, you know, if in the event that we are to encounter some sort of weather event like rain, that can affect not only the production process, but, but the experience itself. We've had experiences like that uh, in Orlando. In two, two uh, years in Orlando, we had rain. Uh, it comes, it goes away, and we continue. We had a hurricane in Puerto Rico once. I mean, we've we've uh, we've had some serious weather conditions, uh, but it doesn't stop the party. In terms of the venue itself, how did the the venue itself has built-in structures and in, a built-in infrastructure, buildings and sets year-round? So, how did that play into your plans when you're? laying out the festival grounds and how did that affect the atmosphere that we're trying to create? A lot of the structures that are in TRF, the Texas Renaissance Fairground, they're really, really cool. Um, obviously, they're all stylized in a sort of Renaissance aesthetic. Some of them are more fantasy based. You know, you, there's a couple buildings that have dragons on them, sort of things like that. We wanted to incorporate the village as much as possible. Obviously, we sort of similar to how we were talking about the site being a Rubik's Cube earlier, we had to sort of condense certain areas with the size of the festival as it is this year. We can't use the entirety of the village because it's actually a really, really big space. And we, each one of these structures is owned personally by individuals that come to the Texas Renaissance 
festival each year. So we reached out to those that were in our footprint and we think that it'll it'll really be a magical experience. And just being within the village itself is a really incredible sort of feeling because you feel like you're fully transported somewhere. I think a lot of fans are excited about the camping too because after the festival is over, the party doesn't really stop. There's going to be after parties, sound camps, which are new to Insomniac. So what can you tell us about the camping experience at Middlelands? We drew the inspiration for uh, camping from our uh, event up in Michigan, the Electric Forest, which has turned out to be a tremendous success for, for Insomniac and Madison House. And we felt that the Insomniac fans were due for another uh, regional camping primarily camping festival. And when this uh, opportunity came across our, our desks in Texas, we uh, uh, took it on, embraced it, and uh, we're creating a, a, a pretty amazing camping experience, which uh, Connor can tell you more about. We're inviting some people to come to the campground and set up their own sound camps, which will be um, playing music throughout the entirety of the night. So if you, if you get done with the show and you're not quite done partying, you're gonna have the option to continue well into the next morning, although I do recommend you get a bit of sleep. But we're gonna have a center camp called Conqueror's Court, and there's gonna be lots of activities during the day there. We're gonna have some games that people can play around that area, and we're gonna have our own sound camp set up in Conqueror's Court that will also be playing well into the night after the show. That's gonna have a bunch of special guests. I think we've already released a few lineups for that. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a, there's going to be a center bonfire around there, around Conqueror's Court. I think we're going to have a, uh, a ritual lighting ceremony after the event each day. And we're hoping that this camping experience is, some, is, is something that we can grow into a, uh, we have some ideas for the future that we're envisioning. Um, so we're hoping it's going to be something we can grow just like Electric Forest grew into a, a fantastic, beauty, beautiful camping experience. We talked about Mother Nature and its unpredictability, but what were some of the challenges you had in planning and pre-production of Middlelands? The challenges of the weather and the challenges of, of really the terrain uh, are things that uh, we can't really control, but we can certainly adapt to. We've got a pretty amazing team. Be before I came to Insomniac, I was primarily in the rock and roll industry touring, uh, where we build the same stage in every city that we go to. And there's not a, lot, a whole lot of cha change and not a whole lot of surprises because it's, it's the same venue that uh, the show before you did, you know, three weeks ago. Where Insomniac and, and the Insomniac festivals differ is pretty much every venue, every year, every festival that we do, no matter what the brand is, is new. There is no tour. There is no what we did last week or, or, or three days ago in a different city. So those challenges have always existed. And, and the team that we have understands that those challenges exist. And we've uh, put together the, the right combination of, of both technical and creative people that can go into a, a parking lot or a cornfield or a speedway and put up the most amazing venue possible and create an experience for our fans that uh, nobody, I don't think no one else in our industry can come close to. At any point during the Middlelands pre-production, did this remind you of the first time we moved to the Speedway with Vegas, with EDC Las Vegas? Very much so. The only difference is we had a little bit more time to, to plan. We had, we had three months to move everything from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. And uh, this one, we've been planning on it for many months. But a lot of the same, you don't know what to expect. They've got uh, uh, people that work there, you know, all year long that, that have uh, certain expectations and, and anticipations. So it's, it's uh, kind of a meeting of the minds. And, and uh, most of the, uh, I would say almost all the venues that we work in embrace us because they know what we produce and, and they're excited to see us come on board. And uh, not just the fans, but the uh, venues and the people that we work with in the communities aren't disappointed when we leave. That's right, because it's a new festival, it's a new venue, but it's also a new team of people that we're working with. What's been the reaction of the Texas Renaissance Fair to Insomniac? I think it's been been very, very good. There's a mindset in everywhere we go, and we don't go in there and, and think that we do it right and do it 100% uh, and, and force people to change. We, we go in there thinking, okay, we're going to do this as a partner. We do have a way that we want things to look and how things to work. 
And obviously with our success, it works right. And most of the people understand that. And we don't get too many uh, upset folks from the venues. Uh, the most people that we get upset from are the the, the residents who right. who don't really know us. Right. But like I said, once once they get to know us, once they, they really see what we do, uh, it's it's not so bad. I, I can give you a, a story. When we did the first show uh, outside of Austin, and I say that because it was so far outside, I don't think there was a real town or, or a city near it. It was uh, Apache Pass. And, uh, you know, we, we start building up and we start uh, doing all the production. And then the Wednesday, Thursday night, we start turning on some lights. And Thursday night, we must have had maybe 60, 70 people lining up with their cars just stopping on the road looking and just gawking and wondering what the heck is going on there but it was amazing you know they were they were all thoroughly impressed it was like the you know the circus and the mardi gras had come to their little <laughs> patch of texas <laughs> it was fun i think what i'm personally most excited about is our headliners going full on with the costumes and totems and the whole theme because I still believe to this day that we have the most dedicated fans in the world and the fact that people are coming from all over the world to Middlelands, to the first ever Middlelands with costumes and diving into the Renaissance rave theme. I'm hoping it's a great, great turnout. Yeah, and we want to say if you're listening to this, we want to encourage all of you to make sure that you participate and come with some costumes ready to go. Yeah. It's your contribution to the festival. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's not asking too much and I personally love dressing up. So I'm going to be dressed up as a pirate during the entirety of Loden. So I hear there's a rumor in the office about the base wench making an appearance at Middlelands. Is that, is there any truth to that? There is truth to that. The base wench will be hidden somewhere within the Middlelands village. You'll just have to figure out where it is. You'll have to travel the grounds, explore, and uh, find the wench. Wide Awake Stories. Broadcasting from the Insomniac HQ. As many of you guys know, especially if you've been following social media uh, lately, it's not easy to put a festival together. Uh, those guys do an amazing job logistically. I mean, just get everything set up and, and looking fabulous before people show up. If you're making it to Middle Ends this weekend, do yourself a favor and find the wench. It's a huge art car, steampunk vibe. It looks like a big ship. No sails. It's going off. It will go off. But we just don't know exactly where, so... And search for Rob and John, too, because they'll be hiding in the secretly placed in the festival as well. And the party will be going on there as well. So you just got to find those guys, too. John will be wearing a puffy shirt. Puffy shirt. Puffy shirt. <laughs> Middlelands is going to go off. I mean, yeah. center camp, sound camps, bonfires, Group archery camps. tag, secret after parties. Sets, after, I mean, just everything. It's pretty crazy, man. We've never thrown a party like this, huh? You definitely won't want to miss it. If you really want to get aggressive with your festival and because you know it is festival season after all you can just hop on down to beyond mexico which is just a hop skip and a jump from texas and uh, join us for our first ever beyond wonderland mexico if you are heading out to middlelands or if you're heading out to beyond mexico let us know hit us up on the rave hotline call us up 310-818-9406 tell us what you're going to be wearing where we can find you maybe we'll hit you up for an interview for wide awake stories not what you're wearing right now what you're going to be wearing yeah show. not what you're wearing now although if you are oh, wearing something now, what are you right? wearing right now we just want to hear from you give us a call now the rave hotline has been absolutely blowing up yeah, it's um, so fun it is fun to listen to all y'all call in and some of you really are on point with your messages and some of you maybe just you know need to leave Get better messages <laughs> But Rob, uh, Rob poured through the uh, the collection that we've got, and uh, here's a few choice ones that we wanted to serve up for you on the show. Hey, what's up, Insomniac? So last summer, I took my dad to Electric Daisy Carnival in Las Vegas for Father's Day. Um, my dad's a huge Vegas fan. He loves the vibe, the gambling, the drinking, all that fun stuff. He's a party animal. But when I took him to the gates at EDC for the first time, it absolutely blew his mind. Uh, he likes, you know, the killers. He likes a little bit of above me on, stuff like that. But surprisingly, his favorite stage of the whole thing was the Wasteland stage. Even though he doesn't like hard style, he thought that the whole San Francisco vibe was pretty damn cool. So now every time I'm home, I hear my dad telling his uh, 50 and 60 year old friends about the time he went to the Electric Daisy Carnival and uh, how it was pretty awesome. So thanks for giving my dad an awesome Father's Day last year, Insomniac. 
Yo, what is up, guys? I am Taylor from Washington State up here, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for having Elon on the radio. It was such a blessing as a trans fan and as part of the trans family. Uh, what, what I like to call those uh, musical orgasms you get is I call that whenever a trans song hits that spot, that's when I say it hit the musical G spot. And uh, not to... Uh, not unfamiliar <laughs> listening to Elon and all the Antuna, all the Antuna cooks. So I just want to say thanks. You guys are doing awesome. Love the radio show, but more trance is never a bad thing. Peace and love, guys. Have a good one. Hey guys, uh, I was listening to Wide Awake Stories just earlier today, trying to pass time at work, and I love the story about the girl who her dad made her the candy for Beyond Wonderland. I just wanted to share a similar story about my mom. Uh, last year when I was going to EDC Las Vegas, first time going to EDC in Las Vegas, and I was so excited. But it was also my birthday. I was turning 21 on the first night of EDC Las Vegas. I was so excited, and we went out to go get supplies for candy, me and my mom. And she asked if she could make some with me. I told her, absolutely. I would love it. So... I go through a couple days of making candy, stuff for me and my friends, and then she just comes in the day before I leave and gives me this bright yellow piece of candy, and it just says, Mom's watching, and it really inspired me when I heard the other story about it, because it shows, you know, even with the stigmas about rape culture and all that, that your parents or whoever is always supportive, and even though they might be skeptical, they just want you to be safe because they love you. And no matter what, peace, love, unity, respect doesn't have to be only in the rape culture. It can be in families, too. Thank you, guys. I just wanted to share that. Have a good day. Hi, my name is um, Angel Hernandez. Um, I'm from Long Beach, California. Um, I do remember this one time. It was probably like the second time I've ever seen my sister in my whole life. I've only met her one time when I was a child. A little kid. I'm 26 now. So we actually met at uh, EDC 2009 in LA and uh, it was the first and only time I ever got to really meet and talk to my sister and we actually got to, you know, uh, enjoy the race together, enjoy, enjoy some sets and uh, it was a very magical night. Never, I'm a single child, so it's, um, it was very unique. It was a very unique experience. Uh, hey, how's it going everyone? How's it going? That's well. Thank you for everything for what you do. Um, so, raising with families, yeah. Um, this year, I recently just turned 18, and I am finally going raving. I'm finally going to EDC for after all these years that my parents and my family have been going to raves and whatnot. And yeah, today, I, I talked to you to tell you the story how I'm finally going to EDC with my parents. It is going to be a blast. <laughs> I've been waiting so long for this, and I am honestly really glad I get to do it with my parents. It's really an experience, because it's so unique being there with people that you grew up with and grew up listening to house music with. It's really great. I'm excited for you to see this year. My aunt, she was a DJ back when I was younger, and then right around when I was three, she passed away. And ever since then, like, family has been a huge thing with me with music. Because my aunt, she would, like, influence, like, the music and the house music scene and all this and that. It was great. The whole family got into it, and it was just, it was honestly a blast growing up listening to house music, and it was amazing. And now, this year, EDC 21, I finally get to experience it with my parents and the people I love the most. I'm really excited. Thank you so much for this event that you were making. It is honestly such a blessing what you do. Thank you, Pasquale. You are tuned in to Wide Awake Stories. I love that we have the rave hotline, man. It's it's uh, the internet is great, and, and reading tweets is fun. But man, no, nothing quite like listening to people's messages. Yeah, it's funny. <laughs> Super random sometimes. With EDC Las Vegas coming up, we wanted to send out a little bit of a different call to action for you all this time on the Rave Hotline. We want you to call up and tell us about your favorite EDC Las Vegas memory. 
Did you get proposed to at EDC Vegas? Did you get married at EDC Las Vegas? Did someone break up with you at EDC Las Vegas? Did you push the button? Did you push the the button? Yeah, exactly. Did you pop someone's rave cherry? (laughs) You know, tell us about your favorite memory from EDC Las Vegas. I mean, we have tons here between us, but we've talked about those tirelessly. We want to know about your stories. You could do that by calling 310-818-9406. What's that number again, Rob? 310-818-9406. 818-9406. Someone who has collected his fair share of stories is our next guest on Wide Awake Stories. His name is Michael Tolberg. He's a longtime rave photographer who put out a book uh, last year, I think it was, called Dance Floor Thunderstorm. It was a collection of photographs uh, that he has accumulated in his, what, almost 20, 20 plus yeah. years of shooting the rave scene. Yeah. His new book is called Raver Stories Project. And just like Wide Awake Stories, the whole thing was created to celebrate you guys. Um, It's a collection of stories from ravers, promoters, DJs. And it's not just old school ravers. Yeah, it's new school guys too. It's the younger audience, the EDM generation. Uh, I think it was really important for him to have this be a project that wasn't just about back in the day. He came by the studio last week and we had a pretty good chat. I've known Michael for almost 20 years now. So we go back a long ways and we shared some personal stories. Sam, this is uh, that old school sand story that uh, I have. We I've reminisced heard that story, about yeah. It was legit. This is Wide Awake Stories. Thank you for coming by, Mike. Mike is a longtime photographer in the LA rave scene. He's been shooting, God, I don't even know how long. I've I've known you for about 15, 6, no, Something. 20, almost probably 20 it's years cl- now. Getting close to 20, yeah. I mean, I've been shooting at a little more than 20 years. I started in the clubs in Hollywood in like 93 and 94 and graduated to the rave scene in 96. Pretty much didn't uh, look back after that. Back in those days, I was writing and photographing for all the major dance music magazines. So it was a really, really heady period. It was an amazing era and a very important era in American pop culture. I liken it to the beginning of the jazz age in the 30s, where you could also draw parallels to the uh, rise of punk or hip hop. I mean, they all shared certain elements, you know, with the whole rave thing, especially the whole do it yourself mentality, which was born, of course, mostly out of necessity in those days. Which leads us perfectly into to what you're working on right now is it's called the raver stories project and what it is it is a collection of stories about uh, people's most amazing memorable or transformative moments you know in the rave scene as written by ravers themselves well it's mostly ravers it's uh, ravers and some promoters and some djs but basically it's being put together to give you know people a voice as to why this whole rave thing is so important to them, why it touches something deep inside them, why they keep coming back to it again and again. What happened was I late last year, I put out a call to action from the electronic uh, music community asking for their you know their best stories and the response i got was fantastic i mean i got stuff from all over the world from england from argentina all over the states it was really a privilege to go through a lot of these uh, stories because some of them are very touching the subject matter runs the gamut i mean we've got stuff from the tiniest little warehouse parties up through the biggest festivals like electric daisy carnival there's stuff from the original acid house explosion in england in the late 80s and it goes pretty much all the way through today so you've got two generations of dance music fans represented in this thing and I felt that was very important because uh, it is important to track the evolution of this whole thing from its humble beginnings back in England and Europe through to the massive festivals which tour the world today. I mean, it is a long continuous story and despite sometimes what the original rave generation and the EDM generation might think about them, say, think about each other. It is important that both are represented. Uh, it would be disingenuous to talk strictly about, you know, the old days, whatever. I mean, it, I could have, you know, easily put together a book, you know, like that. But I felt it was important to show how this thing has lasted so long and why. 
being able to collaborate with these people. And, and that's what it really was. It was more than just editing. It really was collaborating. Being able to tell their stories and keep it in their voice. That was one thing I was very conscious of. I did not want this to be my interpretation of their stories, which is why I left a bunch of these stories. You know, the grammar isn't the best, you know, in there. That didn't matter very much to me. What mattered was that the points were made clear and the story came across so that people could understand it. Did you have to throw out a lot of stories, I imagine? Uh, there were a number of stories that had to be thrown out, but majority of the submissions did make it in. And uh, it was a pleasure and a privilege to go through a lot of these because, first of all, I learned so much about what was going on in terms of the scene in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. And second, just to get inside these people's heads and to trace these wonderful moments that basically solidified their, you know, their standing in the electronic music community. There was one girl who, uh, as a young girl, she was, her life was full of emotional and physical abuse. And the rave scene was one of the things that really helped heal her and get her back on a more even keel. There's a, one story about this a Chicano DJ and producer who was basically saved from the clutches of gang life by the rave scene. I mean, he had a lot of his gang homies, you know, die while he was getting into the rave scene. And he knew that if he had gotten into that lifestyle, he would have ended up like them. There's a, one story, it's called Parents Who Plur. It's about a, a husband and wife who most of the year, you know, are perfectly quote unquote respectable, you know, members of society. The husband, he's a uh, ex IT executive at a bank in his hometown. The woman is a stay-at-home mom. They have a seven-year-old autistic kid. And about twice a year, they go out to festivals and just go nuts. <laughs> you know, they just let it all completely hang out. There's one story in particular for me that really stands out. It's a, kind of a mixing of the old school and EDM. What it is, it's a story from a woman in the Pacific Northwest named Margaret, who is currently 56 years old, and she basically first got involved with the rave scene at age 48. She's always been a huge fan of dance music back to the 70s, and she was an early adoptee of uh, electronic music, but she never knew about raves or anything like that until she got into her mid-40s. And uh, she ended up catching quite a bit of heat from some members of her family, you know, for uh, going into this, you know, dastardly rave thing, you know. But uh, when she went to her first party, she was just completely uh, overwhelmed in the best possible way. She knew at that point that she was going to get much more involved in it. And uh, for someone at that age, the juxtaposition of someone, you know, in their late 40s, early 50s, getting into electronic music during the EDM wave. It's a, it's a very weird sort of thing, but it's also a very positive thing, I think, because it shows, you know, how across generations this thing reaches. I, I was very fortunate enough back in the 90s to insert myself into the center of raving culture out here in Los Angeles. People have to remember that in those days, in the 90s and early 2000s, Southern California basically became the center for raving culture in this country. I mean, it was obviously all over the country, but the core was here. Because, yeah, we had parties in the warehouses, but we also had parties in the desert. We had parties in the, in the mountains. We had parties on the beaches. We had mansion parties. Basically, anywhere where someone could stick a sound system away from prying eyes. I mean, we even had a party at the Federal Building. Yeah, it was several. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved those parties because uh, these parties were held at the Federal Building in Westwood in Los Angeles on Wilshire Boulevard, which is a major artery, you know, going through that part of the city. I mean, these parties were uh, usually protests against things like the Rave Act and stuff like that. And they would usually have about a... About 1,500 to 2,000 people would show up and inevitably a lot of them would spill out onto the sidewalks and people driving by on Wilshire Boulevard would just be staring at it going, what the hell is going on here? I mean, one of my favorite shots in Dance Floor Thunderstorm is a guy, a raver kid in his Jenkos and, you know, dressed the nines in rave gear and he's uh, holding up a great big sign that says, dancing is not a crime. And I thought that's perfect. I mean, that just sums it up right there that you know that one kid that one shot you know that was it god there's been so many great parties i mean organic in the mountains mm -hmm. um 
Juju Beats? Yeah, Juju Beats um, in the mountains as well was a great time. Yeah, Narnia up there in the mountains. I mean, there was the there was a ski resort that was used numerous times, you know, for that. In the desert too, I mean, Dune, Moon Tribe. I've got a photo of yours from Dance Floor Thunderstorm that I got from you mm. of me at Dune that I didn't realize <laughs> I made it in your book, but I was flipping through your book and saw myself, so I had to get that photo and get it blown up. Um, <laughs> I actually have a story about that party in uh, the Raver Stories Project. Um, what a lot of people don't know about that party is that a huge sandstorm came blasting through there at about midnight and sent almost everybody scurrying for their tents. Didn't Christopher Lawrence have a stack of quarters on his tone arm to keep the needle down he, on the record? He did. Uh, what happened was um, the wind from that sandstorm was just whipping up everything and the turntable arms were being blown all over the place, you know. And so what they ended up doing was they ta uh, taped stacks of quarters to the end of the turntable arms to weigh the needles down to keep the needle on the record. The problem was is that that night, Christopher was spinning mostly with acetates, not regular vinyl, acetates, which is softer. And so the combined weight of all those quarters and the needle and all the sand that was in there just totally grooved out a whole bunch of Christopher's records that day. He took a huge hit for the team. It was really a, a incredible night, not just because of the sandstorm. Um, I mean, <laughs> although that was certainly memorable. I mean, the, the sand was literally blowing horizontally, like at 60 miles an hour. I mean, if anybody has any notion that they can, you know, just walk through, you know, a sandstorm and, you know, come out intact on the other end. No, <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> but anyway, after a few hours, finally, the thing blew itself out. And then at about six, when the sun started coming up, Duran got onto the decks. And that was when everybody came out of the, their tents and got their second wind. And uh, like at seven in the morning, the place was raging. It was absolutely raging. I'm getting a little goosebumps right now just thinking about it, man. Like, because I do remember that whole experience. And it was, uh, it wasn't the funnest thing to go through at the time, but the energy in the morning when the, the wind stopped, um, yeah, it was just, it was kind of unparalleled. Do you think the stories are going to stay the same over the next 10 years for, for people that are getting into dance music right now? I think certain elements of the whole rave story will remain the same. The healing properties of this music, the uh, the inclusive nature of this culture. I think it's important to have dance music in your life. I mean, it helps on so many different levels. It's not just about the music and it's not just about the party, but it really does bring people closer together and mm -hmm. makes a positive impact in a lot of people's lives. I agree. I mean, I wouldn't have been sticking around in this whole thing for as long as I have if I didn't agree with that. Cheers. Cheers. Wide awake stories from Insomniac. That was a little trip down memory lane with Tolberg and all those old school parties and Right to Dance and Dune and that sand story for Sam. If you guys are interested in helping get Tolberg's book off the ground, go to Indiegogo and search the Raver Stories Project. There's a few days left in the campaign and you guys could help make it happen. Uh-oh. You know what that means. That sound means the Sam is in the building. It's the banger harp. <laughs> You're not doing track of the day though, Sam, right? No, we're doing things a little bit differently this this time. We have Planet Rock coming up in about a week. Yes. San Francisco one is happening May 12th. And then the show goes from San Francisco to LA the next day on the 13th. There's a Breaks revival happening at the moment and Pasquale has been a fan of Breaks since day one back in his warehouse and desert party days. So, um, really supporting this this movement as much as he, as he can and i think the first step is through planet rock yeah the lineup is pretty stacked who's on that lineup again it's crafty cuts dj icy and special guests sindin and low 99 bringing the, the blog house in in anticipation of this uh, mega event we thought we would play a few breaks tunes for you so my pick is a little weird because uh although left right is blowing up in the scene. His sound is a little uh, bit of a mixture between breaks, uh, garage, and bass line. So he's not essentially a straight up breakbeat artist, but it's definitely a huge, huge influence on him. And he is releasing his latest single on Punks, which is Stanton Warriors label. Uh, the track is called Heat, and I really couldn't think of a better name for it. And you'll understand why when you hear it. 
track for sure i co-sign on that fire indeed john what'd you bring <laughs> nothing why i don't know anything about breaks so i'm leaving it to the old farts yeah <laughs> we came in with a little uh, old school selection sam brought the new heat and uh, rob and i are gonna bring that old fire rob why don't you kick things off with yours first yeah, yeah. some say we don't deserve this earth we walk upon. my selection this week is a little odd odd because it's a breakbeat tune by one of my favorite house acts dub tribe sound system the song is called mother earth and it came out in 93 and it was hugely influential to a lot of the breaks tunes that were coming out in the 90s and early 2000s i mean you could hear chemical beats by the chemical brothers came out in 95 you could definitely hear this song in the chemical brothers tune dj ic was no doubt influenced by this tune as well and i think the first time i saw this live was at a flammable liquid it's an old SoCal rave that Doc Martin did. It was probably 96 or 97 that I heard this and Dub Tribe played it live. And when they play live, they play everything live, like right there on the spot. There's no DAT recordings. They're not pushing a button to trigger any sounds. Everything they do is is happening right there in front of your face. And I heard this about five o'clock in the morning and it just kicked my ass and I've been a fan ever since. I want my money back! for my track I had to go to the one breakbeat artist who really inspired me to become a breaks head uh, back in the day the one and only uber zone my tune is called the freaks and it came out around 97 which is right when I first started to DJ and this tune plus really all of uber zone stuff inspired me to to buy a pair of techniques and, and start DJing and, and DJ in college and DJ after college and start going to insomniac parties and uh, I also feel like it's a little appropriate because the Functified Freaks are going to be coming to Vegas. So I was kind of on that freak tip, on that freak mode. For anyone who knows, um, Uberzone, like uh, Dub Tribe Sound System, did a live PA. You know, Tim would pick up the drums and he played his electronic drums and played live synths. And Davey Dave would come and scratch records over the top. So an Uberzone show was definitely a cool little thing to experience back in the in the late 90s. So this is my tune. It's called The Freaks. If all this breaks talk sounds like a foreign language to you, we actually tap Low 99, who we mentioned is playing at Planet Rock 
this month. We built a Planet Rock playlist that is uh, on Spotify for you to check out. But we also tapped Low99, who's playing the show, for a Planet Rock special mini mix where he breaks down a few of the breaks tracks that kind of influenced his sound during his formative years. So we're going to leave you with 10 minutes of Low99 in the mix. See you next month. Peace. Laters. Hey, what's up? This is Low99, and I'm pretty damn keen to be playing Planet Rock this May. San Francisco and LA, Crafty Cuts, Freestylers, DJ Icy, Sindon, and myself. It's going to be sick. So if you're in the hood, make sure you get down to the party. Uh, yeah, also pretty damn keen to show you this DJ mix I've done. Um, basically, if you know what I make now, it's sort of a combination of house and bassline and garage and breaks all in one. I don't even know what you'd call it. But <laughs> a lot of the stuff I do is influenced by all the breaks that I used to play and I grew up to when I was a young youth. Um, and uh, I went back to my mum's house and uh, grabbed all my old vinyls and CDs. I've spent the last week ripping them on the computer and I've just done this 10-minute uh, mix of basically like 12 of the records that really sort of shaped the young low. <laughs> and um, yeah, hope you dig it and I'll uh, see you at the party. Peace. Snatching all manipulated soul signing Uber song song. Africa Bambada comes to earth to turn you on. Back with soul signing force, we come to right to wrong. Uber song, drop the tone.
Before them can do it so Get down mass up on the dance floor Yes I will get up on the mass floor Get down mass up on the dance floor Anytime I come to me you're hard for Get down mass up on the dance floor Yes I will get up on the mass floor Get down mass up on the dance floor Anytime I come to me you're hard for Get down mass up on the dance floor Yes I will get up on the mass floor Get down mass up on the dance floor Anytime I come to me you're hard for Get down mass up on the dance floor Yes I will get up on the mass floor Get down mass up on the dance floor Anytime I come to me you're hard for episode of Wide Awake Stories.